Let's jump into the biblical text. John chapter number 18 is where we'll spend our time uh, today. This is uh, the final Sunday of, or the final Sunday before Advent, uh, where we are obviously moving into a uh, high holy day, a high season of liturgical worship for the Christian tradition. This particular passage is so interesting. Uh, as I was kind of vacillating between which passage to preach, I almost just picked a Thanksgiving passage, uh, but I looked at our lectionary passage and I found uh, a whisper from this text. It just jumped out to me. And the, the theme of this passage is uh, uh, fits inside the lectionary. It's called the reign of Christ, R-E-I-G-N, the reign of Christ in the liturgical uh, readings of the text across the church globally. Uh, this passage is intended to uh, bring to light uh, the paradox, the kind of ways in which uh, the reign of Jesus, if you will, Jesus as, as king, Jesus as sustainer and provider, uh, Jesus as Lord. What does that mean for us who follow the ways of Jesus in a time where it appears uh, that there is uh, the reign of empire, the reign of a form of violence that is both systemic and personal? Uh, what does it mean for us to follow Jesus in a time and in a season where uh, we may struggle to make sense of our lives in this context. And so uh, I, I, I landed on this passage and, and I find it to be a passage that may interestingly be more apropos during the season of Easter or Lent when Jesus is going before Pilate uh, on his way to the cross. Uh, and yet I found this passage speaking uh, in a real interesting way to our current context. So I landed here. I hope the passage blesses us. I hope the preaching blesses us. I hope it gives us a little bit of a primer for what I think will be the significance of Christmas, the significance of this idea that Jesus is coming. Dare I say that Jesus has come. Dare I say that Jesus is going to keep coming again and again and again. Uh, I think it's a great gift of our faith to keep being reminded that Jesus continues to come, to show up, that we are not abandoned. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm not abandoned. Amen. That's not the sermon title, but it could be. Praise God. But it won't be today. All right. John chapter 18, uh, the text reads, and again, we don't have many slides today because we thought we weren't going to have any power. So you just have to uh, pull out your, your phones or something, or maybe they'll pull up, the, pull up something. But nevertheless, John 18, uh, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, and this is uh, the pericope of the text. John records uh, these words. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. It's so fascinating uh, that you have these folks getting ready to turn Jesus over to the state, over to the Roman empire. And while they are getting ready to serve up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world, they're doing it in a way where they can keep their religious practices intact. Ain't that deep? That just kind of just dawned on me at the 10th, 11th time reading the passage. That they wanted to make sure they handed Jesus over to Caiaphas in the palace in the morning so they would not be deemed unclean so they can still go to the temple at night or the next day. It's kind of like, you know, Christians in the, you know, 1950s down in, you know, I don't know, the South who lynched Christians at nighttime, you know, went to church in the morning, lynched them at nighttime. I don't know, stuff like that. You know, I'm going to keep my religious practices, but I'm going to be wicked <laughs> when I leave the church house. Of course, that's none of us in here, amen. We very consistent. Somebody say amen. Give your neighbor a high five. Tell them at least you consistent. Amen. Mm -hmm. Verse number 29. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? Talking about Jesus. If he were not a criminal, 
the Sadducees, Pharisees said, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate says, well, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. They said, but we have no right to execute anyone. And this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. So verse 33, Pilate then went back into the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you king of the Jews? Jesus asked, is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? He was asking, who's snitching on me? Amen. It's like I'm surrounded by snitches. Amen. Folks just loose with their lips and running their mouth. I didn't, I ain't even told you nothing yet. Mm -hmm. Jesus, you know, probably turned up a little bit while he on his way to the cross. Verse 35, Pilate says, am I a Jew? Pilate's like, well, what are you talking about? Like, how would I know these things, right? Your own people. Mm -mm -mm. I almost preached a message said, it be, it be your own people. But that felt, that felt too petty. Somebody say, man, I didn't even make one of my points, but you ought to tell you that it be your own people sometimes. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, listen to this, because it's going to be the meat of our text today. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. I love another version says that my kingdom is otherworldly. Man, that felt something. I said, mm, just like a mm, I said, otherworldly. Woo. Don't you want to be a part of an otherworldly kingdom? Amen. Don't you want to boldly go where no one has gone before? I know I do. Say, man. Verse 37, Pilate says, you are a king then. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate asked, what is truth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're gonna preach from the topic today. Don't ignore the truth. God bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your, this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please allow the preaching and the teaching of your word to be made easy to the people who are here to hear to grow, to be encouraged, to be healed, to be saved. Lord, may it set up shop in our hearts. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Come on, let the people of the way say amen. Amen. Don't ignore the truth. Martin Luther King Jr. preached a sermon in 1954 entitled The Transformed Nonconformist preached while he was at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, where he offered a powerful framework on how we ought to live as people straddling life within what he called two kingdoms, the kingdom of time and the kingdom of eternity. And in this particular sermon, this is what he boldly declares, one of my favorite passages from Dr. King. He says that every true Christian is a citizen of two worlds, the world of time and the world of eternity. The Christian finds himself in the paradoxical situation of having to be in the world, yet not of the world. Indeed, this is what is meant by one of the passages that reads that Christians are referred to as a colony of heaven. So you don't know what a colony is, but like Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, which means that they're an outpost. They don't have full rights, but they are uh, linked and, 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 and under the rule of the United States. Uh, various uh, empires have 
outposts in other places. Do you not know that the United States is one of the few countries in the world, maybe the only country in the world, that has a military outpost on every continent? Mm -hmm. So King goes on to say, this figure of speech should have special relevance for us in America since the early days of our nation's histories were days of colonialism, where 13 of the states of our union were originally British colonies. And although our forefathers had relative freedom in forming their institutions and systems of law, their ultimate allegiance was to the King of England. And so, listen, although the Christian finds himself in the colony of time, the Christian's ultimate allegiance is to the empire of eternity. In other words, the Christian owes their ultimate allegiance to God. And if any earthly institution conflicts with God's will, it is the Christian duty to revolt against it, to resist it. Now, Dr. King, obviously writing this uh, sermon, is preaching to a bunch of black folks living in the South in Jim Crow America. And he's trying to, I'm sure, encourage and remind his church members that Although they may find themselves living as a citizen of the United States, there is a greater authority than the limited legal framework of Jim Crow. Trying to remind them that you are following an eternal king, an eternal authority, an eternal God. And I love Dr. King's intellect. I love his activism for so many reasons chief of which is his ability to both read and interpret, to reflect and act, to wrestle and resist with the contradictions of our human and divine situations. Dr. King didn't reach for easy answers, as a matter of fact. He made concrete through a certain kind of spiritual and intellectual integration uh, 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 articulation of what he called the beloved community, a description of how we could live, attempting to live out the commands of Jesus in a world that seems to be anti-Christ. Now, I, you know, you know, been in church my whole life, and so it is so important to acknowledge that uh, everybody throws around the word antichrist uh, when you talk about somebody that don't agree with you, especially if you're a Christian person, you know. I remember when, uh, you know, uh, Barack Obama was the president, he was the antichrist to a certain group of Christians. And then Trump became president, and he is the, or he was the antichrist. He's, you know, we, easy for us to call him the antichrist. And so I'd be like, can both of these guys be the antichrist at the same time? And it makes me often ask myself, why is it so easy to identify the Antichrist among Christians, but it's harder to identify Jesus? What does one do with faith when it becomes a proxy for other people's oppression? What does one do with cultural pride when it becomes an occasion to reinforce othering and exclusion rather than belonging and inclusivity? What do you do with your notions of love and intimacy that end up producing violence in your relationships with your partner, with your children, with your neighbor, rather than pushing us towards peaceful resolutions? What does one do with your money when it fuels our obsession that reduces our lives to secure in the bag and ending up losing your soul along the way. These are the questions among many left unnamed that should cause us all the same kind of pause it caused Pilate when he, through his inquiry with Jesus, ends up just saying, after exasperation, what is truth? Because you got to believe that Pilate is probably used to talking to people and they are very intimidated. 
I mean, kind of like, you know, you go before a judge or you go, you know, dealing with the police, you're dealing with somebody you know that has some authority to impact your life. There's very few folk who's just kind of turned up in a kind of way. It's like, don't you know I have my life in your hand? And then you say, but what is life? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Don't you know I could kill you right now, but what is death? And you're sitting there like, wait, wait a second, who is this, who is this guy? <laughs> He's supposed to be begging me for mercy. But how many of you know that there are moments in your life where the truth hits you in the face and it causes you to take a few steps back, almost like a good wake-up call, almost like an alarm? ringing and going off. Uh, I, I, I'll never forget this time I was uh, uh, getting ready to do an interview on, on some, some news station. And, and you know, uh, this is probably during COVID because uh, it was the first time everybody, you know, setting up home studios. And, and so, you know, I went and I bought me a, a, a bright light like that to just blind you. Praise God. You <laughs> seeing spots everywhere. <laughs> He's trying to just look. Yeah, it's just like, what is going on? Amen. I'm just blinded by the light. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so I had this nice, big, you know, uh, table set up. And I, I thought I had a really good setup, you know, because in the early years of COVID, people were winning awards for their home studio. So, you know, I was trying to, you know, I don't want to try to win an award, but I don't want my thing to look bootleg, you know. And so, <laughs> set up my thing and, and, and get on. And, and the technician on, on the other line is, is like, your, your, your uh, setup is great, man. This is a nice setup. Uh, Pastor Mike, I was like, well, thank you. You know, I, you know, I was trying to do a little something, something, you know. And, you know, and, and then all of a sudden he said, wait, do, do you hear that? <clears throat> and I was like, you know, I don't. Do, do, do I hear what? And, and they're like, don't, do, do you hear that beep? I said, no. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm not looking at them. Every, nothing's, you know, it's just beep. Said, did you hear it again? I was like, no. You know, I thought they were gaslighting me, you know. So, you know, I'm kind of like, man, what are you, like, what's going on? It's like, there it goes again. And, and I'm like, I'm not, you know, so I'm kind of getting a little irritated because, you know, I'm now I'm thinking, no, this racial, you know, so it's, all, it's always racial. You're trying to, like, what, what's going on? You're trying to, like, do, say, do something to me? What are you talking about a beep? I don't hear no beep. And then it's like, there's a beep in your background. It's like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly what you're talking about. And, and, and so, you know, I, they said, well, just, just, just sit there for it because it's going every 15 to 20 seconds. Like, you know. So, you know, I'm, you know, trying not to get kicked off the interview before I get on it, you know, by going off on the person. So, you know, I just sat there and real quiet and silent, and all of a sudden I heard a beep. And I was like, wow. And then from that point on, every 20 seconds, it was a beep, and it was my fire alarm. <laughs> this fire alarm had, and this, you know, I've, I maybe, I don't know, I've been living in the house, same house for a while. I don't know if I ever changed fire alarms for about 10 years, so I don't know how long the beeping had been going on. <laughs> but I had become so conditioned to this beep that I could not even hear it anymore. And now I still hear the beeps, you know. I mean, I've, you know, it's just started again like maybe a few weeks ago. Because I... <laughs> I had a, somebody come in and change the, change the batteries because the ceiling is so high that I can't reach it myself. So I could do it myself, but I just couldn't fix, you know, the ladder was too big. But the point, the point remains is that I had conditioned myself to ignore the alarm and got used to living with an alarm going off meant to save my life in case of a fire. And it made me ask myself, what is it that I've become conditioned to about God's truths that makes me so familiar with it that I don't have a reaction like Pilate where I get so exasperated with the conversation I'm having with Jesus to take a step back and say, well, what you talking about, Willis? What, 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 what is truth? Because how many of you know that 
the true truth never conforms to our lives with enough familiarity where it ought not cause you to have an alarm going off from time to time. Many of us are like Pilate in that when we are face to face with Jesus, we often get confused about what we're seeing. Is Jesus a liberator? Is Jesus a moral exemplar? Is Jesus a teacher? Is Jesus a Christian myth? Does Jesus' way of life work in the face of inhumanity, in the face of depression, in the face of human struggles and challenges and injustice? Is Jesus' way relevant to my struggle to keep my marriage, family, children, job together? Is Jesus around while people are dying in my neighborhood and in Palestine and in, 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 in South America and the Congo and Sudan and Ukraine? And, uh, is Jesus way relevant enough to sustain me when my money is funny and my change always feels strange? What is the truth? Well, Jesus records his sermons in these gospels in ways that continue to beckon us to wrestle with this question. Jesus says in John 14 that I am the way, the truth, and the life, which is to say for the follower of Jesus, we're on solid ground if we start with Jesus as the source. But it's a start because Jesus' way of life is worth examining for we who are searching for truth. The foundation of Jesus' life is worth embodying for the follower of Jesus if we are serious about truth. But I got to admit that in a so-called Christian society like America, that cannot be adequate because then you gotta ask yourself, which Jesus are we starting with? Oh, Lord, have mercy. There was a time where I wouldn't ask that question, but now there's so many Jesus is running around America today. I mean, I'd be wondering, Lord, have mercy. They just passed a, 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 a law, the, the Board of Education in Texas, that is allowing a curriculum to be used in the classroom, infused with Bible stories in a way that privileges American Christian discourse over other religious traditions. And I've heard it say by so many Christians that we got to get the Bible and God back in school. And I, you know, used to say, well, did God ever leave? If, 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 if you there and man, your kids is there, then I'm sure God is there. But so what, what are we exactly talking about? Right. And so, but, you know, I know that there is this kind of sense that, you know, oh, the young people, they so godless. Ain't that what we say about our kids? Oh, they so godless as if the kids is raising themselves. Mm hmm. Oh, the kids, they this and they that as if they just got here and just, you know, picked it up all on their own. Similar efforts in Oklahoma, Louisiana are afoot, making this a growing trend among the Christian nationalist movement gaining steam in our country. Don't you know that it's very dangerous for a Christian nationalist version of Jesus to be taught in the schools? Amen. If, if that's the Jesus, that's the Bible you're going to put in the schools. I don't want Christianity taught in the schools especially by those folks. Did you not know that there was a Bible given to the slaves and they cut out all the scriptures in that Bible that had anything to do with <laughs> liberation and freedom? <laughs> Say, here, read this Bible. Well, that's what they want to put back in the schools, in my opinion. They ain't going to cut the scriptures out, but they're just going to tell the story of Jesus in a way that negates what I think truth requires. What good is it to teach Christianity in the classroom? but leave out Christ. What good is it to require Bibles in the classroom, but ignore the truth? The truth to me, to us, I pray, is the Jesus of the Christian nationalist movement that just elected Donald Trump to be the president of the United States is not the Jesus that came to save the world from their sins. 
The Jesus of the Make America Great Again political cult. I got to be careful because now they're trying to come after nonprofits. But guess what? We just going to be a non, we going to be a snatched nonprofit. <laughs> Sorry, I had to find another charity to donate to. Somebody say amen. But how many of you know the Jesus that we read about in Scripture taught us to love our neighbor as ourselves? Taught us to love our enemies. Woo! How I many know even I, I, I don't want the, I don't I don't be wanting that Jesus all the time. Be like Jesus, I don't love my enemies. You don't know my enemies. My enemies ain't worthy of that love. That Jesus taught us to make peace and not war. That Jesus taught us to take care of the poor and the destitute. That Jesus taught us to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. This Jesus, somebody say this Jesus. This Jesus is the emperor of the kingdom of eternity. Which just is to say, beloved, that this Jesus never loses their claim on our lives. All of us may find ourselves living under a kingdom of time. But how many of you know that all of us at the same time are still living under the authority of the king of eternity? Who is asking you and I to wrestle with the truth? And one of the biggest questions I have for us today is in light of all the things that we must deal with in your personal journey, in your, in your physical life, in your mental life, in your spiritual, your relational life, one of the questions I want you to wrestle with today is what will you do with the truth? The truth that is eternal, the truth that reveals himself to us. What will we do with the truth when the truth is hard to handle? <laughs> Jack Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth. And he was right. <laughs> Some of us can't handle the truth. Some of us don't want the truth. Some of us want to believe a beautiful lie. Lord, help me in here today. How many know a beautiful lie is very convenient? It, 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 it lets us off the hook in places where we have tension, but it leaves us intact in places where there is no dissonance. But I have found that the truth will set us free if we will surrender ourselves to the tensions of this truth. I have no problem with you and I wrestling with the truth questioning the truth because Pilate did Jesus did lots of the followers of God in the text question God when they didn't understand so the question is not the problem is not the challenge what I want you and I to un understand about truth is that it must not become an extension of our internal rationalizations of what we like at the expense of of what God is asking of us. It cuts both ways. It cuts both ways in your marriage. It cuts both ways with your kids. It cuts both ways with your finances. It cuts both ways with your politics. It cuts both ways. It cuts all kinds of different ways. Can anybody just think of the times where you, you knew that God was asking something of you, but you rationalized it away? <laughs> I don't mean to be in your business that bad, but a little bit. How many can be true, uh, honest with yourself and say, I know that this was true. It wasn't necessarily written down on no Ten Commandments. It wasn't necessarily preached to me by the preacher. But there was something inside of me that said, I ought not treat this person this way. I said, but you know what they did to me? <laughs> Anybody, is that just me? Just internal rationalizations? Internal conversation you have with yourself to excuse behavior that you know Wars against the way we are called to live today. And I believe that one of our greatest challenges in this season is to appreciate that there is truth that must not be compromised 
by we who follow the way of Jesus. And I'm not talking now about a list of sins and do's and don'ts. I'm talking about that conversation you have with God. <laughs> Where God asks you to do something and you be like, boo. Mm. <laughs> that, that conversation you have with God when nobody's around and you by yourself and you know that God is asking you to love your neighbor. You know that God is asking you to forgive. Woo. You know God is asking you to give, to sacrifice. You're like, mm. <laughs> but what about me, God? Anybody ever told that to God? What about me, God? What, what, you asking me? You asking me to be true to you? Who's gonna be true to me? <laughs> I wish I could talk to you the way I talk to God. Amen. Like, who? who what? What about me? Anybody ever felt like I, I'm being asked by God to just be out there on a the ledge? And you, you, you doing a dance with God. Anybody ever dance with God on the, on, the, on the edge of a cliff? You were feeling in many ways that the cost of truth is high. See, beloved, I do believe that there are things that you and I must lean into if we are going to embrace and not ignore the truth. I'm going to hasten to my points here. The first thing that I believe you and I must be willing to do if we are not going to ignore the truth is ask the right questions. Talk about how to ask the right questions. Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? What is truth? Those are some heavy questions. I find that I am more willing to ask my therapist harder questions than I am God. And I don't want you to, you know, uh, demean or not talk to your therapist because sometimes your therapist is an agent of God. I know mine is. Somebody better thank God for my therapist. I mean, I'd be locked up somewhere. Be like, man, Pastor Mike need to go see a therapist. <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five. Tell him see a therapist this week. It's okay. Hey, man, you, you need to go see somebody. Go lay down on that couch or sit in that chair and let the truth of healing of your mind. But how many know that you ought not say to your therapist what you cannot say to God? You ought to have a life of prayer and conversation with God whereby you can ask God some hard truths. Why do the wicked seem to prosper and the righteous struggle? Paul Tillich, another theologian, called it the questions of ultimate concerns. How many of you can relate to this uh, prayer life you have with God where you give God, you know, things that you could solve on your own, but you just need a little extra help rather than the things you know are beyond yourself? What are the things that trouble you the most? What are the things that keep you and I up at night? Asking the right questions is half of the way you don't ignore the truth. The other half is to make sure you're asking the right source. And there are some folk who can't answer your questions. Thereby, you should stop asking them. Because people who cannot answer your questions and give you an answer anyway are liars. And how many know we got a lot of liars out here in the world? A lot of folk who, who, who love to tell us things that they thought up just yesterday. Oh, you know, I remember when I was in uh, physics, and, you know, I was one of these kids. I was pretty smart, wasn't smart in physics, but I was, you know, smart in a lot of other things. And, but, you know, I didn't know I wasn't smart in physics yet because I was only in 11th grade. So, you know, when you're in high school, you know, you, you don't know what you're smart at yet. Smart at yet. Yeah, yeah. You don't know how smart you are yet. So you try out everything and see where you land. But, you know, uh, I, was lay, I was hanging out with some of the knuckleheads, you know, some of my friends who weren't smart about anything. And because I wanted to fit in, I would just play dumb. Anybody ever play dumb? <laughs> some of you still playing dumb right now. It's like, it's like you with people, you know, Lord have mercy. You, you know that, 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 that you know, there's a, there's a gap, praise God. But you like the gap because it gives you power. It makes you feel good. You don't want to be, like, you know, on the same level with some folk. So, you know, you play dumb. Oh, I, what? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yes, you did. This is the 10th time you've been through this situation. You know. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, you know. Mm -hmm. you know. You know what this is. You're not unfamiliar. But in this physics class, I was playing dumb. I did not yet know that I didn't know physics. And so it was very clear to my teacher that I was at a different kind of 
level of education than my friends, not because I'm inherently smarter than them. I just had a better, you know, K through six education. You know, I went to private school, Christian private school with the, you know, Southern Baptist Church racist people. They, they, they did teach us to read and write, though. I got to give them that. And so that helped. Read, write, add. I got that. Amen. All the, you know, so that helped me. And, 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 and what was very interesting, that when they put us in group projects with the people that didn't know anything, I, because I was trying to fit in, would often appeal to people I knew did not have the answers. And yet they had a lot of confidence about what they did not know. How many of you know there are people in the world, Lord, help me in here today, people in your life, dare I say it may be you sometimes, who can be very confident about what you don't know and love to swim in lakes and oceans filled with untruths because there is no accountability when something is true but you or no one else knows about it. You and I have to be lovers of truth. Somebody say, I got to love the truth. I, I, I got to be willing to sit in places where I can know truth is attainable and I can ask the right questions among people who are searching for truth so I do not become a liar. That ignores the beeps. Because, you know, the ugly truth about that whole interaction with the uh, technician is my vehement denial about a beep was turning me into a liar. <laughs> this person is probably looking at me like, now, is this person mad? Are they crazy? Because, you know, we got another term for called gaslighting. Somebody say, man, you know, when you know something's true and somebody's telling you that's not true, you're like, mm -hmm. And then after a while, they, you know, they become so convincing that you start to question your own self. Well, maybe, you know, maybe it is raining outside. And it's just dry as the desert. <laughs> First set of questions, do you come to God with true questions? Or the ones that are confirmation bias questions. I, I worry that we as Christians in the United States come to God with confirmation bias questions. Questions that we already have determined the answer, and then we come to God and just ask God to confirm what we believe, rather than sit in some hard truths. God, is it okay for me to have my tax dollars mass killing poor people in the world? When was the last time you asked God that question? God, is it okay for me to, like, you know, hate my neighbor because their music is too loud? Is it okay for me to unleash, you know, just ask God hard questions. Questions that you know probably going to cause you to, <laughs> you know, ouch. Because it is those kind of questions I believe you get closer to the truth. The truth that will what? Set you and I free. Second thing, the question uh, that, that I think is important for you and I, if we're not going to ignore the truth, can we live, no, not can, we must be in faith community. If looking for the truth among liars is the wrong way, direction to the truth, how many of you know living in faithful community is critical to stumbling into the way of truth? I, again, am someone who finds myself constantly asking God, what do you require of us in this season? I ask God often, you know, is your work in the world static, meaning just very unalive? Is it as concrete as this, po this podium? It does not bend. It does not, is it, is it, is it uh, uh, unable to to, to adapt to the realities of our current circumstance. Because there is something about a faith that is doctrinal driven and not spirit driven. It is, it is, it is 
a role for doctrine and theology. Obviously, I study it. I embrace it. I love it. It provides stability. And yet I know there are parts of my life's journey that I see the spirit moving in between the gaps. <laughs> I see the spirit showing up to heal in places that the doctor said was not able to be healed. I see the spirit putting things back together that everybody said was unfixable. I see the spirit taking the worst pain in my life and bringing it to a place of healing for myself and others. How many know that the spirit knows how to take the thing that others see as very concrete and, 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 and unflexible and the spirit has this ability to just turn it into something dynamic? Oh, somebody said, give me more of your spirit. God. I, need, I, I need more of your spirit that can take my life however my life is and mold it into something that brings life to me and others. But being in community is one of the surefire ways of experiencing the spirit, this spirit that moves and transcends and, 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 and feels, right? And, and, and I love that the community of faith where the spirit shows up are often defined through the ways of Jesus. Now, I, I, I picked out uh, a whole bunch of ways that I, I feel like the Spirit uh, shows up among community when I look at the life of Jesus. Let, let me just read a few of them off. Uh, the, the, the Spirit shows up in communities that surrender themselves to God. Now, this, this may seem rudimentary, but I have found that surrendering oneself to God is a lot easier than it sounds. I preach a sermon on that. I won't today, but just think about communities that surrender themselves to God. Communities that love without limits. Communities that live among the faithful for purposes of discipleship. Communities that meet seekers of truth wherever they are. Jesus said to go out to the highways and the hedges. I mean, some of our communities of faith become citadels. They become bunkers. We run into these communities, some of these communities to hide rather than to be empowered to go. Communities where the spirit shows up, they attend to the oppressed and suffering. You see the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is trying to challenge these folk who are in a precarious situation themselves to go back to your communities and attend to the world as it is. Communities that challenge systems that harm other people. Communities, I love this, where the Spirit shows up, they embrace miracle signs and wonders. Oh, they, those Clark sisters, they sang it at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the thing. I'm looking for a what? Miracle. I expect the impossible. I see the invisible. I Feel the intangible. The sky is a limit to what I can have. Lord, I mean, you, 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 ought to, you ought to look up the Clark sisters. I'm looking for a miracle. Print that verse out and just put it everywhere in your house. When you go to brush your teeth, you ought to be reading. I'm looking for a miracle. When, you, when you're riding in your car, I expect the impossible. No, this, this is the riding in my car. I expect the impossible. When you're looking at, you know, football, 49ers lose again. I see the invisible. Somebody say amen, right? You ought to be able, beloved, to be in a community that can expect a miracle. Run away from communities that only see what everyone sees. I don't need to be around people that can only see what you see, see what I see. I need to be around somebody who can look at me and say, there's something more <laughs> happening right here. I don't know what it is, but there's something more happening with your family, more happening at your school, more happening with your money, more happening with your journey, more happening with this pain you're in. I need some eyes who can help us to appreciate that this is truth, that God is working even when you can't see it. Communities that are willing to risk it all for God, communities that are willing to endure persecution, communities, uh, Easter's coming, that can anticipate resurrection. 
These are places where I believe the spirit shows up in abundance to fill the hard places in our lives. And this is the truth, beloved, that you and I have an opportunity to reject empire and live out the kingdom of eternity. You and I have an opportunity. We have a, 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 a choice. It's like a multiple choice question. A, B, C, or D. Which one will we choose? And I do believe, beloved, that the kingdom that Jesus speaks of, he says is otherworldly. It's not of this world. This kingdom, this way of life is not one that lays easily on top of the ways you and I have been formed. This kingdom that is otherworldly should shake you and I up from time to time. It should cause you and I to wake up and look at the world as it is and say, this is not what God intends. God is asking for you and I to be more than participants in a kingdom that emphasize scarcity when God creates with abundance. God wants you and I to be people who are not privy to violence when God invites us to the ways of peace to reject hatred and embrace love, to, 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 to problematize individuality at the expense of the collective, to ask questions when merciless behavior extends us an invitation, when Jesus is constantly asking you and I to be compassionate, to say, I'm not gonna hoard when I'm invited to be generous. I'm not gonna be seduced by fear. And believe me, there's some things to be afraid about right now in the world, but it will not turn you and I into cowards. Where all of a sudden we're just gonna shrink because something is on the line. Hmm, I will not become hopeless. When I am connected to a well of hope that does not run dry. This is how we don't ignore the truth. The truth is this. As Jesus stands before Pilate, and Pilate is peppering Jesus with questions, Jesus is talking to someone who likely, for every person that brought Jesus to Pilate, they understood Pilate to be the truth. <laughs> This man can hurt me. He can hurt all of us. That's true. And yet Jesus' interaction with this expression of truth caused that truth to ask, what is truth? Beloved, what if you and I lived in a way where people who engage with us become very clear that what they think is truth is actually not the truth. That the way of Jesus is true. And we are God's people. Tell your neighbor, you're God's person. We are God's people. And this is an invitation then for us to live as God's people. Live it out. It's gonna be hard. I'm not the preacher's going to lie to you. <laughs> give Jesus your, your what, what do you say? Get a preacher your hand to Jesus your heart. No, don't give me your hand. I don't want your hand. But give Jesus your heart. It's going to be hard, though. Following Jesus is hard. But it will set us free. Freedom is not for the meek. Freedom is for the bold. It is for the audacious. It is for the courageous. But when you finally get free, you cannot be bound again. It's hard. It's hard to bound a free person. You'd be like, no, this is, I'm free. I love freedom too much. And how many of you know that it is God's will for us to be free? Free in your mind? Free in your heart? Free in your spirit? No substance. No circumstance. No person. No system. 
can bind a person that the sun sets free. Come on, stand with us, everybody. Don't ignore the truth. Don't ignore the truth. Song says, speak to my heart. Holy Spirit, give me the words that will bring new life. Words on the wings of the morning, the dark nights will fade away if you speak to my heart. Grab the hand of someone next to you. Come on, say, speak to my heart. Holy Spirit, message of love, message of love to encourage me, lifting my heart from despair, how you love me and care for me. Lord, just speak to my heart, hey, speak to my heart, oh God, speak to my heart. Say it again, speak to my heart, speak to my heart. Hey, speak to my heart. Oh God. Say with a speak to my heart, Lord. Give me your holy word. If I can't hear from you, then I'll know what to do. I won't go alone. I'll never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide and let your word. Come on, say it again. Speak to my heart, Lord. Hey, give me your holy word. If I can't hear from you, then I'll know what to do. I won't go alone, no, no. I'll never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide and let your word. God bless the hand that I'm touching today, God. It is our desire to have a conversation with you. God, we want to be pilot in this situation. Someone who is either bold enough or even in a position enough to have a real conversation that leaves us questioning what we thought may be true. I pray, God, that the person I'm touching today who is indeed dealing with all kinds of real challenges. These are not falsehoods and fakes and counterfeits. These are real challenges, God. I pray that they will have a confrontation with the truth. God, with the alarm that is beeping consistently in their ear, inviting them, God, to ask hard questions to you, God, and not to liars and fake emperors and sources that are not able to give them the answers they seek. I pray, God, that victory and healing and power would be theirs. I pray, God, that you will move them from a place of doubt to a place of confidence that engagement with you is worth the journey. I pray, God, that you'll speak to their physical pain, their mental pain, their emotional pain. God, their relational pain, their economic pain. Speak to them in a way, God, that causes them to embrace kingdom living, a way of life that is exemplified by the way you live. God, I pray that victory will be there. Squeeze their hand gently. I squeeze, Lord, hope and power and victory and love into the hands of my neighbor, God. I know that there is something that they need that only you can provide. So I pray, God, may it be theirs, God. May it be theirs, God. May it be something they leave with today that makes them believe that today was the first day of the rest of their life. Do it in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, do it, Lord. Come on, say it again. Do it, Lord. Now lift your hands where you're standing. God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, my sister, it is not my brother, but it is me, oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need you, God, to remind me that I can have everything. Somebody say everything. Everything you promised. That peace of mind is within my grasp. That joy divine is within my grasp. 
That salvation is within my grasp. Lord God, that sleepless nights and anxiety and worry, oh God, I can trade those in, those sorrows for the joy of the Lord. And God, the tears that I cry can be redeemed for anointing and power. Speak to me. Somebody say, speak to me, Lord. And speak in a way, God, that I can hear your voice. Cut through the noise, God. Cut through the distractions, God. Cut through my doubt and my circumstances and speak to me. And I'll say, thank you, Lord. Clap your hands and begin to thank the Lord. God, I thank you. 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 Thank you for speaking to me, God. Thank you for speaking to me, God. Speak, your servant is listening. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And so, God, we'll say yes to your will. We'll say yes to your way. We'll go wherever. We'll do whatever you say. In Jesus' name we pray. God, somebody say, speak to me, Lord. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, don't ignore the truth. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Clap your hands, everybody. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.